Maybe I'll say a few words uh, before we start. So today our last lecture by uh, Professor Berka, and it's related to generalized pairs. He introduced with uh, Jean, <clears throat> and this is a very good example, especially for young mathematicians, for postdocs and graduate students. Then in mathematics, we have, in certain sense, sometimes uh, generalizations, they are not very interesting. They are good. Sometimes we have generalizations which are very important. And uh, how to distinguish them? So, so the best way to distinguish them in the way that your final result doesn't mention the generalization. For instance, if you can start complements and you prove the boundaries of this uh, conjecture of Borisov and uh, Alexiev, then you don't need generalized power space in this statement. But in the course of proof, they uh, appear. So this is, uh, uh, we can say, necessary generalization just to do this is, uh, construction. And when I, once I told to very one of the best mathematicians <laughs> about this Birkar introduction, that is news incident, he told me this is the best type of generalization. Okay, so he will talk about this, the best type of generalization possible. <laughs> okay, thank you for the introduction. Um, as Slava said, I'm going to talk about generalized uh, pairs in this lecture, this final lecture. Uh, but before getting into the generalized pairs, I will talk about usual pairs, which I mentioned. Oops. Yeah, so I will talk about usual pairs. Uh, I mentioned usual pairs in the previous lecture, but I didn't go too much into uh, details and motivations why we need uh, pairs. But I will try to now explain why we care about pairs. Um, so as usual, we will, we will work over the complex numbers. And uh, we defined pairs and singularities in the previous lecture. And uh, I guess it was clear maybe from the, the context that they play a, a fundamental role in birational algebraic geometry, but also going beyond <laughs> in general algebraic geometry, for example, uh, moduli. Uh, remember that a pair XB is considered of a normal variety X and a boundary divisor B with coefficients between zero and one. And now for simplicity, we will just take rational coefficients, but even real coefficients uh, make sense. And then uh, we also should say that K plus B should be Q Cartier. In other words, some multiple should be a Cartier divide. And then we can define singularities by taking a log resolution, let's say phi from uh, W to X, and then writing the pullback of K plus B as KW plus BW. And we say that this pair is epsilon low canonical if every coefficient of BW is at most one minus epsilon. So there is a bound on these coefficients. And there are some cases, for example, if epsilon is zero, then zero low canonical just means usual low canonical. And KLT means epsilon low canonical for some choice of epsilon. So you don't fix the epsilon in that case. Okay, so this is just a repeat of what I told you before in the previous lecture, but now why do we need pairs? Why do we care about uh, pairs? I will just uh, go through several um, scenarios which make it clear why the pairs are necessary and uh, important to play with. Uh, one of the reasons uh, goes back to the 70s when Itaka studied smooth open varieties. So open here means that you have a smooth quasi-projective variety X, which is not compact, which is not projective. Now, how do you study the geometry of this kind of uh, varieties? Of course, locally, we know what to do. Um, um, I mean, if you go into a very small neighborhood, like analytic neighborhood, then you just have a disk. So there is nothing interesting there. Uh, since we are assuming that it is smooth locally, in a, in a sense, um, the story is not so important, not so interesting. But uh, still, you can ask about the geometry 
uh, like the global geometry of X. And one of the ways to do this is you take a compactification, you make your X projective. So X by assumption is, uh, is quasi projective. So it lives inside some projective space. You just take its closure. But that's not uh, very good because you can have very bad singularity. So what you can do is uh, first to take the compactification and then uh, resolve all the singularities without touching X itself. Uh, so in other words, we can compactify X into some other projective variety Y so that the, the complement of X in Y is a divisor with simple normal crossing uh, singularities. So you just use Hironaka's result to resolve all the singularities. And uh, in general, when you're compactify things, the, the complement can be just one point, for example. Uh, that's not so good. So you can blow things up so that everything becomes a divisor, anything outside. Um, so the complement to X will be a divisor. This is just resolution of singularities. And then the idea is that the geometry of Y the compactification together with this device that B reflects the geometry of X. So basically you define many things about X by defining on this pair. For example, you, you could uh, say you define the Kodara dimension of X or other global invariants by defining it for the compactification. And then of course you should say, you should uh, check that this does not depend on the compactification. So if you can do that, then you have an invariant defined for X. So that's one of the reasons that um, people got interested in uh, pairs because of these open uh, varieties. Uh, you can also notice that this compactification is not unique in uh, dimension at least two, um, but usually the problem that you uh, consider for X should basically be independent of this compactification. So everything will be well-defined. And this whole approach evolved into the theory of uh, pairs. At least it's one of the reasons that people got interested in pairs. Um, okay, another reason for pairs is related to a junction. Uh, now suppose that X is a smooth variety and B is a smooth prime divisor on X. Uh, then there is a well-known uh, classical adjunction formula, which says that uh, if you take the sum of the canonical divisor of X together with B, so you have a divisor, and then you can restrict this as a divisor. Uh, it will be up to linear uh, equivalence. You can restrict it to B. And then what you get is exactly the canonical class of B. Uh, so everything is defined up to linear uh, equivalence. And this is very, very useful because you can relate the geometry of X uh, together with B with the geometry of B itself. And uh, so, so that's not a surprise that this formula, this adjunction formula plays a really important role in, in algebraic geometry in general. For example, if you have curves inside P2, how do you understand their geometry? You basically use the adjunction formula to calculate uh, a lot of everything about the curve. Because in that case, the canonical divisor of P2, you know what, just minus three times a, a hyperplane, a, a line, and then you can calculate the canonical divisor of your curve, and then you can calculate the genus and, and other invariants of the curve. So this formula is quite uh, important. And the point is that here, um, to do, to get information from B to X, you need to consider X B together as a pair, not just X alone. Because the geometry of X and B is not so easy to relate, but the geometry of K plus B or X and B is very directly related to the geometry of B. And uh, in, uh, in modern birational geometry, this idea plays a really important role because many of the proofs go through induction and the induction quite often has to do with this adjunction formula. So we should then study pairs for this reason. Now, uh, 
different reason which somehow also is, is related to the disjunction is the so-called canonical bundle uh, formula. Uh, in this setting, suppose that we have X, which is a smooth projective uh, variety and F is a vibration, uh, is a contraction. So in other words, uh, is projective with connected fibers. So like the, the one we saw in the previous uh, lecture. And suppose that the canonical divisor of X is the pullback of some divisor on Z up to linear or even Q linear uh, equivalence. And the L here, the divisor L on Z can be just a Q divisor, not necessarily uh, an integral divisor. So this happens in many uh, contexts. For example, if you have a Calabia or vibration, then you get this kind of picture where you replace linear with Q linear. I will come back to a more general setting, but for now, suppose that we have uh, uh, this, and then um, we have uh, the canonical bundle formula in this setting, which says that uh, the canonical divisor of X is then linearly equivalent to the pullback of the canonical divisor of Z plus some divisor B plus some other divisor M where B, this divisor B is an effective divisor, it's called a discriminant divisor, and it somehow measures how the fibers of F are singular. So if the fibers are smooth at, uh, as over some point, then you, there is no B, B will be just zero. But if you have uh, complicated singularities, then you, you get a component of B and the more singularities you have, the higher the coefficients of that component will be. So this is called a discriminant divisor, but on the other hand, there is a, a quite different type of divisor, M, which is called a moduli divisor. And there is a good reason for that because uh, this divisor kind of measures how the fibers of F vary in their moduli. Uh, for example, if, the, all the, if most of the fibers are isomorphic, then this M should be just a, a trivial, a numerically trivial device. So it's a measure of uh, moduli. However, this M is not necessarily an effective divisor. It can be in general not effective. Um, so, however, it's now clear that if you, if you want to understand X, you need to understand Z together with these two divisors, B and Z. And a classical example of this setting is is Kodara's canonical bundle formula when X is the surface and F is an elliptic vibration over a curve. So Kodara classified this kind of vibrations uh, using this canonical bundle formula. Uh, so in that setting, it's quite important because it can tell you things about the geometry of X, even in the arithmetic setting, when you, uh, for example, uh, consider an elliptic curve over a number field, then you can uh, spread that elliptic curve out into an arithmetic surface, let's say over the spec of Z or uh, something similar. And then this is like taking an elliptic curve and degenerating it into uh, some other kind of curves. And then the singularities that appear or this arithmetic surface, which is just basically related to this discriminant divisor, can tell you something about the arithmetic of this uh, elliptic curve. So this is important in, in many ways. Now, as I said, if you want to investigate the geometry of X, then we want to investigate the geometry of, um, this is a typo here, the geometry of Z B plus M. However, uh, although in general, we can choose M uh, up to, Q linear equivalent so that we have uh, Z B plus M is a pair, but that's not uh, good because uh, usually you don't want to do that. You don't want to change M up to Q linear equivalent because for many problems, um, for example, keeping the coefficient of uh, M is important. So that's not a good idea just to change M. However, it's better to consider the Z B plus M as a generalized pair. Uh, because what happens in this case, although M is not an effective divisor, but is the push down of an F divisor on some birational model of Z. And this setting gives you one of the main sources of um, 
constructing generalized pairs. So this gives you a reason why pairs are important, but also why generalized pairs are important. Okay, another quite different setting is that of quotient uh, varieties. Uh, suppose that we have X a smooth a variety and G a finite group acting on this X. Um, then since G is finite and we are uh, working with this quasi-projective variety, so we know that by some not difficult result that the quotient of X by this uh, group action exists. And suppose that Y is this quotient. And then we have a quotient map from X to Y. Let's call that uh, pi. Then what happens is that by Harvard's uh, formula and by the fact that we, have, we are having a group action here, we can calculate that the canonical divisor of X is the pullback of the canonical divisor of Y plus some divisor, which happens to be an effective divisor and its coefficients are between zero and one. Um, therefore, it's quite then natural to study y together with this divisor dy rather than just studying uh, y because this formula just tells you that the properties of the canonical divisor of x are related to the properties of ky plus dy not just y itself not just ky therefore it is quite natural that you should study pairs of the form y dy so this is uh, another uh, reason so i gave you a few reasons why uh, pairs appear in, in algebraic geometry, but uh, let me now also just illustrate how we use pair in, um, in practice, at least one example. Um, which this example actually, it's more general forms appear in birational geometry very quite often. Suppose that we have XB a projective KLT pair. And if you wish, just take X to be smooth. Uh, that's not so important. And suppose that S is a normal prime divisor on X, for example, just a smooth prime divisor. And also suppose that L is a Cartier divisor such that uh, A, if I put A equal to L minus K plus B plus S, then this divisor is ample. Uh, so in other words, L can be written down as K plus B plus S plus something ample. Then uh, what can we do with this setting? Um, now we have an exact sequence of uh, cohomology. Uh, so on the level of global sections, uh, the global sections of L on X, uh, you get a map, restriction map to the global sections of L restricted to S. So this happens on S and then this goes to H1. So next you have a uh, higher cohomology H1 of L minus S on, uh, on X. Now, by assumption, L minus S is K plus B plus A. Uh, and K plus B, we say that this is KLT and A is ample. So this divisor that appears here, is written as something KLT plus something ample. Um, but then since A is ample and XB is KLT, yeah. we know that H1 of L minus S vanishes by Kawamata feedback vanishing theorem, which is a more general form of the, uh, the, the Kodara vanishing theorem. Uh, so Kodara vanishing theorem says that uh, if you have a smooth projective variety, then uh, H1 of K plus anything ample will vanish. Uh, but here we have something more general. We don't need uh, to have smoothness. And also the divisor A doesn't have to be uh, like a line bundle. It doesn't have to be uh, integral. It can be uh, just a Q divisor or even R divisor. So this cohomology group here vanishes and that means that all the sections of L restricted to S can be lifted to sections of L on X. And this is extremely uh, useful because uh, for example, if you want to uh, show that the linear system given by L is non-empty, that uh, L has some global section, then um, quite often in applications, uh, we can show that 
L on S has some sections by induction, and then we can lift this section uh, to L on X. For example, uh, uh, Kawamata Shokurov's non-vanishing theorem, well, it's Shokurov non-vanishing theorem, which is used to uh, prove uh, Kawamata Shokurov base point freeness, uses this kind of argument. Um, so another scenario is that you want to show that L is generated by global sections. Um, now, if you can show that it will restrict to S is generated by global sections, then at least this shows that L is also free near S. And then you can accurate this argument by looking at other subvarieties, other devices, and finally show that L is uh, generated by global sections. So this appears uh, very often in in birational geometry, and uh, it tells you that it's important to study pairs, not just varieties. Here, the pair, of course, is X, B plus S, or even if you add in the ample divisor A. So I hope that I, I gave you some reasons why pairs are important. And in fact, the, the classification theory in the last, let's say, I don't know, 40, 50 years, at least 40 years, it has been centered around classifying pairs, not just varieties. So understanding pairs is important, not just for understanding varieties, but just itself is a really important, a very interesting uh, theory. Okay, then we go to generalized pairs. Um, now, before I give you the formal definition, again, I will go through uh, a few scenarios. And in those scenarios, we naturally have uh, generalized structures. Then finally, I'll, I'll give you the, the formal definition. Um, but for now, very roughly speaking, a generalized pair is a pair, just the usual pair, together with a NEF divisor on some birational model of your variety. So just imagine that you have a variety X and then you uh, pick some birational model somewhere and you pick an ample divisor or just an F divisor. That basically becomes uh, a generalized pair. One of the places that this uh, notion appears quite naturally is that of polarized uh, varieties. So suppose that uh, we have a projective variety X and an ample divisor M on it. Um, then we say that X is polarized by this ample divisor M. Uh, for example, this M can be a very ample divisor which gives you an embedding of your variety into some projective uh, space. So that's one uh, possibility. And uh, now polarized varieties are important in moduli theory, because if you want to uh, construct moduli spaces of some classes of varieties, um, it's now understood that what you usually need to have is some kind of polarization. You need some kind of positivity so that you get um, stable objects and so that they, they are well behaved enough that you can construct a moduli space. Uh, one of the primary examples is when uh, Kx itself is ample, and then this polarization is given by Kx. But in general, it doesn't have to be Kx. Um, you can take other polarizations, and then uh, so picking a variety X together with an ample divisor is important. And this is one of the examples. So you have a variety and something which is ample, of course, it is NEF, and therefore you get uh, a generalized pair. So in this case, then we look at X together with M and we call it a generalized pair. Now this is not a usual pair because M is not necessarily effective. Uh, well, if M is ample, you could make it effective up to Q linear equivalent, but uh, in many places, that's not a good idea. You don't want to modify your M too much. Um, now, another context is the canonical bundle formula that I talked about before, but now I formulate it in a more general setting. Uh, this time, suppose that XB is a projective and low canonical pair, and F from X to Z is again a contraction. So X is not just smooth, but we also have a boundary divisor, and we have low canonical singularities. Um, 
And suppose that k plus b is the pullback of some q divisor of that. So in other words, this is a log Calabi-Yau vibration by the definitions of the previous uh, lecture. Um, now suppose, of course, here we need to say that the dimension of Z is positive, otherwise everything becomes just uh, some trivialities. Uh, also, if F is birational, again, you don't get anything interesting. Uh, so this formula gives you interesting stuff when this is a genuine vibration, when dimension of X is more the dimension of Z and Z is not a point. Then in this case, the canonical bundle formula says that K plus B is essentially the pullback of kz plus some bz and some uh, mz, whereas before bz is the discriminant divisor and mz is the modular divisor. Uh, now mz usually is not nef itself, but it's the pushdown of a nef divisor on some high resolution of, uh, of z. And therefore what we have here, we have something like zbz, which looks like a pair um, although by, I mean, strictly speaking, it might actually not be a pair, but it, it looked like a pair. And then we have the pushdown of a nef divisor on some model. So that's uh, basically a, a generalized pair. Uh, in fact, this is one of the main uh, sources of getting, uh, as I said, examples of generalized pairs and applications of generalized pairs. So then it's quite natural that we want to study Z, BZ plus MZ as a generalized pair. Um, so this is quite uh, relevant then. Uh, if you have local labia of vibrations, then this uh, formula applies and therefore you, um, you can use generalized pairs to say something about usual pairs, uh, XB. So we are starting with XB, which is a usual pair. And then uh, we reduce problems about this pair to something about generalized pairs. So as you can imagine, this is uh, extremely uh, useful. Um, another somehow related story is that uh, of a junction for low canonical centers. Uh, this time, suppose that XB is a projective uh, low canonical pair and V is the normalization of uh, a low canonical center. So by low canonical center, roughly speaking, speaking, I mean where the singularities are the worst. For example, one of the main examples is when V is a component of B with coefficient one. That's one of the important cases. But in here, I don't assume V to be a divisor. It can be of higher dimension. Now, uh, again, we want to relate the geometry of V and the geometry of X or XB. Uh, so what happens in this case, we can write down a formula, some kind of adjunction formula uh, where k plus b restricted to v, so this is just the pullback of kb to v, uh, you can write it down as kv plus some divisor plus uh, some other n, where the c is in fact a divisor with coefficients between zero and one, and n is the pushdown of an f divisor. And the way you get this formula is as basically you, you take some kind of a birational model of x and then you reduce uh, to the previous formula, the canonical bundle formula, by uh, producing some uh, divisor, some divisor on your birational model, which maps to V, and then you can use this canonical bundle uh, formula. So again, this is important for um, applications for relating geometry of X, B to V. Um, but anyway, what you are forced to do here is to consider V, C plus N as a generalized pair. Uh, so this kind of formulas for higher co-dimensional sub-varieties, um, it was uh, stated by Aomata. He studied this uh, kind of situation and he called it sub-adjunction. And the reason for that was that he basically said that, well, this N is the pushdown of some uh, effective, some NEF divisor. Now, if you uh, maybe add some ample divisor, you can make it effective and then somehow relate um, this divisor by adding a little bit of uh, ample divide. But here I'm saying that actually you don't need to do that. You just work with V, C plus N as a generalized pair. You don't have to force it to become a usual pair. Uh, this, this is already good enough for uh, many questions. Now, another source of um, examples 
of generalized pairs is that when you look at varieties with minus k nef. And now in the last couple of lectures, we have seen that um, varieties with minus k ample um, in other words, finals are quite important for the classification theory. Uh, but varieties with minus k nef are also quite important because this is just a much larger class. It includes the finals, but uh, much more. However, although there are some studies of this kind of varieties, but not so much. And the reason for that is um, in the case of minus k ample, uh, we basically can produce some pair and then we can uh, modify our variety. We can go on onto some other birational model and still have some kind of final property uh, preserved. But the problem is that we don't, we didn't know before what to do with this kind of thing. If you change your x a little bit, then minus k is not nef anymore quite often. And then what, what do you do next? Uh, so I think that's why this kind of variety were not studied so much before. But now, however, it, it's quite different. Um, if we take x to be, uh, let's say, a normal projective variety, let's say with low canonical singularities and minus k nef, then what we do? Uh, what we do here is just define m to be minus k. As simple as that. And then we get a generalized pair xm because x is a variety and then m is, is nef, such that k plus m is equal to zero. And now this is just like a child play, but in fact, it's really, this is what makes the whole difference. Uh, now we have a pair which is a generalized kind of a log Calabiao pair. And if you have this kind of pairs, for example, uh, you, can, um, you can run the minimal model program and this kind of uh, structure, this kind of property is preserved. If you do a play or what, you have a sequence of uh, birational transformations, in the end, you still have a local IBO uh, pair in this generalized sense. And therefore, you can, um, you are much more free to change your model and then study your, uh, your variety. So now this, um, uh, this concept of generalized pairs has opened the way for studying and class classifying these kind of uh, varieties that could not have been done before. Okay, so I gave you quite a few contexts where generalized pairs appear. Um, now let me uh, then give you a formal definition of generalized pairs. Um, so th this kind of pairs, in fact, they appeared uh, in this formal form. They first appeared in a, in a paper of mine and, uh, and Doji Chang. However, they already appeared in several uh, other papers of mine, but they were not just formally defined. They were either some special cases were defined or they just appeared um, implicitly, not formally defined, but they were actually appeared and even used before in, in several papers. Um, now I, I will just for simplicity define everything in the projective setting. Suppose that, um, yeah, a, a projective generalized pair now consists of several uh, data. First, we need a normal projective variety X. Uh, we need, uh, let's say, a Q divisor B. Uh, if you like, you can say coefficients to be between zero and one, although that's not so important for now. So we have an effective divisor. So far, what we have is something like a pair, an X and a boundary divisor. And together now with an F divisor on some birational model. To be more precise, we have a birational contraction phi. For example, this can be a resolution from X prime to X and a NEF Q divisor M prime, which lives on X prime on this birational model, such that K plus B plus M is Q Cartier where now M is the push down of this NEF divisor M prime. Uh, and this is just a little technical condition that is two cards here so that you can define intersection numbers, pullbacks and so on. We have the same condition for pairs when M is just uh, zero. Um, so yeah, in fact, if M prime, you take it to be zero, then what you get is exactly just a pair. 
So that's why the generalized structures are something more general than usual pairs. Um, so what you need to remember is just that you have something like a pair and a NEF device on some birational model. For example, this can be an ample device. Now, there are some flexibilities here that you can allow. I mean, it's just up to you how to define things. But uh, so far, usually what we have been doing is that we specify this X prime and M prime only up to birational uh, equivalence. In other words, uh, if I take uh, another birational model of X prime, let's say I take another resolution of X prime and then I pull back M prime to that new model, uh, then we have the same generalized pair. We don't distinguish them. But there might be cases, uh, especially if something is related to modular and so on, there might be cases where you also insist to just fix your model X prime and fix your device. But so far for all the applications we have, this is not important. You can change your model and pull back your device. And then, so in particular, we can assume this phi to be a lower resolution of XB. Then we can write down the pullback of K plus B plus M as in a unique way, we can write it as kx prime plus b prime plus m prime. So m prime is already given. You just need to find uh, b prime. And similar to the case of pairs, we define singularities in terms of the coefficients which appears in b prime. Um, to be more precise, we say that this generalized pair is generalized log canonical if the coefficients here are at most one. Uh, generalized KLT means coefficients are strictly less than one. And epsilon log canonical means coefficients are at most one minus epsilon. So the definition is pretty much the same as pairs, except that you need to take into account M prime. This M prime also contributes usually to the singularities. So we have uh, generalized pairs and we also have a way of defining their singularities. Uh, we can also define them in, in the local, in the relative setting, but um, for simplicity, let's not go into that. Um, now let's give some, uh, one explicit example. Well, we already saw several examples uh, before I give you the, the formal definition where we, we looked at polarized varieties, canonical bundle formula and so on. But let's just look at one explicit example that we can see everything. Now in this example, we take X to be P2 and we take phi from X prime to uh, X be the blow up of a point, close point X. So you just have P2, you blow up a point and you have a one exceptional curve of this blow up. And let E prime be this exceptional curve. And also suppose that L is a line passing through X so L is on X and L prime is birational transform. So we have P2, we have one point. Uh, we take a line passing through this point. And then I blow up this point. I have an exceptional device, the E prime. And then I have also the, the line, it's birational transform, which I call it L prime. So this is basically the, the data we need. Here I can define generalized pairs in many different ways, depending on what kind of uh, coefficients I take. For example, suppose that we take B to be equal to zero, but take M prime to be equal to L prime. Okay, then we can calculate B prime in this case for this generalized pair X B plus M. And this B prime is in fact exactly equal to zero. And therefore the singularities are pretty good. They are KLT in particular. Um, but let's just play with it a little bit more and change uh, some stuff. Let's take B to be zero again, but now I'm changing M prime to twice as L prime. So here I have just L prime, but here I have twice as L prime. Then in this case, we can calculate that B prime is equal to E prime. You see that here B prime is zero, but here you get a new uh, divide. This uh, exceptional divide now becomes part of the, the B prime and therefore X B plus M is generalized low canonical, but it's not generalized KLT anymore because coefficients here are 
precisely one. You have coefficient one here. Okay, let's just play a little bit more, still take b to be equal to zero, and I am so far just playing with the net divisor and ignoring the b part. This time I take m prime to be three times l prime. So I have a net divisor which is uh, larger in some sense, it has more positivity. Then the generalized pair that I get is not generalized low canonical anymore, because in this case you can calculate that b prime is equal to two times e prime. So the coefficient two here means that you're, you are going outside the category of low canonical singularities. Um, now, if you do the calculations yourself, uh, you see that the way that the singularities are defined here, uh, the way that this divisor and prime uh, affect the singularities, it simply has to do only with the, the fact that the intersection number of L prime with E prime is equal to one. Uh, so in this case, intersection of m prime with e prime is one. Here, intersection of m prime with e prime is two. Here is three. So what really matters as far as singularities are concerned is how your NEF divisor of state intersects exceptional divisors. So the, the stronger ample, uh, the stronger positivity you have, the larger intersection numbers you get and the deeper singularities also you will get. Uh, so that's basically uh, the idea. But again, in this setting, if I take B to be equal to L, this is the line passing through the point, and I take M prime to be twice as L prime. Then again, the generalized pair that I get is not low canonical because in this case, B prime will be exactly L prime plus two times E prime. So the coefficient here is one, but the coefficient here is two. So this is not low canonical anymore. So this I guess will show you clearly how singularities are defined and how they behave in this setting. Okay, now let's look at some applications of um, eta configurations. I have something like 15 minutes. I, um, on the other hand, I have some applications to show you and some uh, open problems. So I think I'm not going to, uh, to go through all these things. It's too much. Maybe I'll skip some of these things. Uh, but let me mention this first application, which, uh, which is where the generalized pairs were formally defined uh, and studied. Suppose that we take W, a smooth projective variety of, uh, of quadrat dimension uh, kappa W non-negative. Uh, now, by definition, the quadrat dimension is the largest number kappa belonging to the, the set minus infinity zero one up to the dimension such that the limb soup of uh, the global sections, dimension of global sections of m times k divided by n times to the kappa is positive. So roughly speaking, this says that uh, these global sections, uh, they grow similar to m to the kappa. So for example, if, if kw is ample, then this will be just equal to the dimension. Uh, and if you have one section for every m, then this kappa will be equal to zero. Uh, now, since quadrat dimension here, I'm assuming is non-negative, so it's zero, one, or uh, going up to the dimension. Now, by Ithaca, by a construction of Ithaca from the 70s, if we take M to be sufficiently divisible, then the linear system defined by M times K defines a rational map for you. So in general, if you have any divisor, it's linear system will define a rational map. It can be an empty map, but in this case, quadrat dimension is non-negative. So this is a, is a well-defined map. And this map, this rational map is called the Ithaca vibration. Uh, so it's from W to X, and this makes sense only uh, up to by rational equivalence. That means that if you, uh, there is some room here to replace X with something with uh, a high resolution and so on. So it just specifies the by rational class of X, not X itself. Now, why this vibration is important? Because if you look at the very general fibers of uh, W to X, then they have quadrat dimension zero. 
Moreover, the dimension of X is exactly the quadratic dimension of W. So if a quadratic dimension is maximal, then this map is just birational. So in a sense, you don't get anything new, but if quadratic dimension is zero, this map is just a constant map. Um, so it's more interesting in between when the quadratic dimension is more than zero, but less than the dimension, um, more interesting things can happen. Now, uh, one of the main results of uh, mine and Jank in the same paper that we defined this generalized space is that we can choose M to be bounded depending only on the dimension if we bound, if we fix certain invariants of F. Now, it's actually conjectured that you can choose M bounded even if you don't fix any, any other invariants. However, that's an extremely uh, difficult uh, conjecture. So what we did, we basically reduced that conjecture to some uh, special uh, case, a special statement. So in this case, we are fixing some topological and, and algebraic properties of F. And then we said that we can choose M depending on the, di on the dimension and on those invariants that we we picked. Um, but let's see how this works. We apply the canonical bundle formula, but in a slightly more general context. Uh, this formula says that uh, if you per perhaps modify W and X, because everything here is defined by rationally, so that's not a problem. Uh, then what you can do is you get a divisor B, which is effective, and a NEF divisor M, this are on X, such that the global sections of M times KW will be naturally isomorphic to the global sections of M times KX plus B plus M downstairs on the base of the vibration. Uh, if your M is divisible by some fixed number, and this fixed number has to do with the invariants of the general fiber that uh, we fixed. So in other words, if you want to uh, prove this statement that, um, that you can define uh, the quadratic dimension, uh, sorry, the eta vibration for some M, uh, which is bounded. Now, Itaka's construction says that you get this vibration if you take M to be sufficiently divisible, but we say that we can actually take it to be bounded. And what you need here is, is this linear system on X should define a birational map. That's what you need. Uh, so it's enough to find a bounded M such that M times K plus B plus M defines a birational map. Now, what we have here is a generalized pair. It's X, B, which is a pair. X, you can take it to be smooth. And M, which is NAF. Um, now, this birationality follows from a much more general statement uh, proved in the, in the same paper, which says that if you fix natural numbers D and R, and also fix a DCC set of non-negative, um, let's say rational numbers. Here I, I wrote R, but let's take this to be rational numbers. And assume that uh, XB is a projective log canonical pair of dimension D, the coefficients of B are in phi. For example, this can just be in a finite set. And then R times M is a Neff Cartier divisor. But in this setting of the application, uh, all these properties are satisfied from the assumption. And also suppose that K plus B plus M is big, which is again the case in this uh, setting here. Then the statement says that M times K plus B plus M defines a birational map for some bounded M. Here means that M will depend only on D, R, and phi, and uh, that's it. Um, so that's how the generalized uh, pairs appear, but the, the proof of this statement makes use not only of just simple definitions and consequences of the definition of generalized pairs, but it makes of really very not real uh, generalized pairs. Um, I should also mention that for usual pairs, in other words, when M is equal to zero, this second statement here was proved by Haken, McKenna, and Anjou. Um, but the proof for the generalized setting does not just follow from the usual pair case. You need to do a lot of work to 
um, to prove this theorem. Okay, so that's one of the applications. Um, another application, um, now I go a little bit fast. I don't really have time to go too much into uh, details, but one other application has to do with boundedness of complements and of uh, final varieties. Uh, because in the settings of proving uh, boundedness of complements, uh, I just uh, mentioned that the, one of the cases that we have to prove that comes up in the proof is that uh, we have a vibration and then we have a pair which is trivial along this vibration. In other words, we have a local ABR vibration, we apply the canonical bundle formula, and then we need to understand complements downstairs for KZ, BZ, MZ. And here, since coefficients are important, just as in the previous application, you can't really easily modify M. That's why it's important just to consider it as a generalized pair and not try to modify M, for example, make it effective and so on. Um, so this is another application, of course, from this then uh, B, A, B conjecture was derived and so on. Um, another setting is that of varieties with NEF anti-canonical divisor or more generally when you have a, a pair with minus K, B, NEF with some nice singularities, at least in dimension three, uh, when X is rationally connected, uh, we could show that they form a bounded family up to, up to isomorphism in co-dimension uh, one. So this is one of the things that was extremely hard to prove before, but now with the machinery of generalized pairs, this becomes much more, this kind of problem become much more uh, tractable. Okay, I don't go into the details here. I just go through the slides. You can watch the video later and read all the, all the details. But there have been many other applications of uh, generalized pairs. Uh, for example, Mor Moraga and then later Haken and Moraga, they apply this um, generalized pairs and ACC for generalized low canonical thresholds to prove termination in some cases. For example, termination of flips for uh, pseudo-effective pairs of dimension four, which was open before, but with these generalized pairs, you can approach these kind of problems. And also, uh, Jing Zhong Han and Li, they studied uh, existence of minimal models. Um, and they showed that if you have weak zero skip compositions, then you can get uh, minimal models for generalized pairs. And also, uh, myself and Philip Azian Svaldi, uh, independently, we showed um, that if you have pairs with minus K and F, then you cannot have more than two components in the non KLP locus. And then we have results about toric kind of applications. And finally, also about devices on Calabiao varieties. For example, if X is Calabiao of a given dimension and N is any big veil divisor, then M times N defines a birational map. And this is quite important. For example, for construction of modular spaces of, of polarized uh, uh, Calabiao varieties. So these are some of the, it's just a sample of applications. There are um, more, but let me also finally just mention a couple of problems in the next, uh, like what, I have five minutes or so. Now, one of the main the remaining problem about generalized pairs is that um, the conjecture says that we can always run a minimal model program on, on any projective generalized low canonical pair, and this will terminate with some model, which has to be a minimal model or a more fiber space. Now, in the KLT case, we know that we can run a minimal model program, but the issue is that we don't know whether it terminates or not. So. However, in the low canonical case, we don't even know whether we can run the program at all or not. We don't even know whether we can do the first step uh, because we need to show that certain contractions exist or some flips exist and we still don't know this. Um, I think even in dimension three, still these are open. Um, but in a different direction related to abundance, uh, abundance is more complicated for generalized pairs. Uh, if we have a projective KLT pair and M a NEF divisor. So this is like a special setting uh, for abundance. And if we assume that K plus B is pseudo effective, 
and k plus b plus m is nef, then what is expected is that k plus b plus m is numerically equivalent to some other uh, device and maybe rotational coefficients such that this other divisor is semi ample. Um, now, this condition here, k plus b, is, uh, is subtle. If you remove that, then everything can collapse. Uh, this was studied by Lavich and Peter now. But uh, let me also mention um, another kind of uh, quite different direction of problems. Um, roughly speaking, what we do here, we fix our mind variance like dimension and so on, and we look at the set of all the projective generalized LC pairs, x, b, blah, m, such that the dimension is fixed. The coefficients of b are essentially in some fixed finite set. So we say pb to be integral and then pm prime to be Cartier. So we are also fixing the Cartier index of, of our nef part, which lives on some birational model. And similarly, define fdp the same way. Uh, except that now we also assume that k plus b plus m is ample and its volume is fixed by v. Um, so we are basically fixing some invariants of this generalized pair. And then the first conjecture says that the set of all the possible volumes uh, for the larger set is dissatisfied DCC. It is similar to a result of Heiken, McKenna, and Drew for usual pairs. And the second conjecture says that there is some fixed m such that m times k plus b plus m is very ample for every pair in the smaller set where we have ample with fixed a volume. Um, again, this is a, a generalization of a result of Heiken, McKenna, and Drew. But the problem is, as usual, these statements can be just reduced to the usual pair case. And in fact, that's why this generalized pair theory is, in, is important and interesting because it forces you to do things which are interesting on its own, even if you don't care about the application. And these two conjectures were verified by Filippazzi in dimension two. Uh, okay, let me also skip this thing and go to the uh, last page. So in the last page, which I'm not going to read, but roughly I want to say that it's also a really interesting uh, project to classify generalized pairs, even if you don't care at all about their applications to usual pairs uh, and varieties, because you are just facing challenges. And that's in some sense, that's what mathematics is about. You define some structures and then you uh, face some difficulties. If everything is extremely easy, then it just becomes not interesting, it becomes uh, triviality. But when you go to this setting, then you see that you get difficult problems. And then to solve these difficult problems, you have to come up with interesting uh, ideas. And maybe those ideas can go back and uh, even have applications to usual pairs and so on, which is usually the case. Um, but I think just to classify these pairs themselves is mathematically is interesting because it just gives you interesting uh, outcomes. And for example, this involves like moduli. What does moduli mean in the setting of um, generalized pairs? If you even fix your variety, let's say a smooth projective variety X, and then consider all the Cartier divisors M, which are NEF even much more strong that they are algebraically equivalent, but consider this a linear equivalent, then what space parameterizes all these generalized pairs? But in this case, it's easy to see that these are parameterized exactly by peak zero. Uh, so in other words, when you classify generalized pairs, you get into um, a much larger territory. It's not just about moduli of divisors, but also moduli, not only moduli of varieties, but also moduli of divisors and so on. And it mixes uh, both theories of moduli of um, line bundles and also varieties. And I think. Um, this chart will be interesting, but this is largely unexplored. That's why it's also good for young people because there is a lot of things to do here. Okay, I will stop here and thank you for listening. Thank you, Kasia.
So first of all, thanks to the speaker. And also, uh, I have, of course, a question. And so sure. one is quite, quite trivial, maybe. <laughs> you never uh, still define what means NEF, but NEF may have many definitions. <laughs> oh, okay. And in particular, uh, we may consider not necessarily complete varieties with NEF divided. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, mostly I worked uh, essentially in the projective setting in this talk, just for simplicity. Yeah. So you have projective, then it's kind of one. Uh, yeah, NEF just means intersection with any curve is non negative. But in the non. You mean this trivial. And yeah. another question, much more serious. Um, when we consider generalized pairs, then uh, we would like to, in some situations, to apply this to classical problems and to understand do they work for generalized pairs, <clears throat> particularly for complements and some other type of stuff. And this. I understand, for instance, uh, they work very well for phonotype varieties, for some special, or for general look, general type, when we consider generalized pairs. But if we work in some way in between, it's appeared like conditions you need to replace linear equivalences by numerical equivalence and so on. And my question is related to the situation, suppose that you consider this again, like you talk of vibrations for generalized pairs, but not modular numerical equivalent, but usually it's not true in general. But is it sufficient, for instance, conditions like in this bed situation, it's enough to suppose that your divisor M is not only an M, but big also. Is it sufficient in some cases or not? If M is big, uh, at least in the KLT case, I think it should be sufficient. But so in some cases you can replace numerical by conditions on some uh, F that is big or has sufficiently large dimension. Or like that. Okay. Yeah, but in general, yeah, this. Uh, in general, it's not true, of course. In general, it's just more complicated. I mean, already uh, it's because it's related also to this abundance uh, issue that. Uh, yeah, yes, I understand. For instance, like abundance. Actually, for arbitrary M, then of course you expect to have some uh, problems. So maybe you can put some uh, more restrictions with stronger assumptions or make your statements a bit more flexible. That's like in the abundance that we don't expect semi ampleness, but we expect semi ampleness up to a numerical. Uh, yeah, yes, yes, what I mean. So you need some. Yeah. So, so you should be more flexible, not to just. That's what I think makes the theory uh, more interesting. If, if everything is trivially following from a usual pair, then what? I mean, there is nothing no, no, no. to do. But I mean, that uh, doesn't follow, but at least how to generalize this statement, especially if we would like to apply them, for instance, to classify varieties with minus K and F and so on. Yes. Okay. Yeah, that's the question. Yes, thank you. Again, and we hope this it will be not uh, your last talk in terms of but maybe sometimes not on Zoom. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. But does anyone else have any question? Yes. It's... So I would like to ask a question. So what's the main difficulty to prove the, uh, the conjecture of McKenna and Prokof in high dimensional case? So that's the main difficulty. The difficulty is that, I mean, what you do in this case is you run a minimal model program, you get a more fiber space. Mm. And then, and now you need to understand the base of this more fiber space. And yeah, so you, in, in dimension three, so since uh, uh, the, the base, uh, uh, the only possible is of uh, a curve or a surface. So it is not, not so hard to, uh, yeah, in this case, because we know much more in dimension three, but in higher dimension, for example, you need to show that the base has also good singularities, like uh, delta log canonical. And this is related to Shakurov conjecture uh, for vibrations, singularities in vibrations, and that's still open. So that's why if the Shakurov conjecture is proved, then it immediately implies this McKernan Prokhorov conjecture. Yeah, 
at mm. least up to isomorphism in codimension one. But if you remove isomorphism in codimension one, then this is more related to the Morrison Kawamata conjecture about finiteness of minimal models for like Calabi R. I see. Thank you. Okay, any other questions, suggestions, <laughs> remarks? Okay. Thank you again. And we are done. Okay, thank you very much for listening. And I hope that the young people can focus on this kind of problem because in this whole area of classification, including this local RBR vibrations and also generalized pairs and so on, there is a lot to do here. Of course, I couldn't talk about uh, all the problems in this area, but there are many, many problems. So hopefully young people can focus on them. And Yes, yeah, it's important for graduate students, especially. <laughs> okay, bye. Okay, have a good time. Bye. Have a good time.